And east, and you have 20 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, as always, it is a privilege to be able to contribute in this honorable house, and even more so on this matter that is before us. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in looking at this motion, I recognize that the member for Orpuch East is raising that the speaker failed to declare a possible conflict of interest. Also that the speaker rebuked and condemned the member for reporting elsewhere on that matter. I also note that the member for Opuch East is contending that the speaker committed a breach of the established rules of conduct and conventions of this house that the speaker in doing so brought the high and noble office of the speaker into disrepute and uh, is asking that the House censures the speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would like to comment briefly on these matters, especially as someone who feels very honored and privileged to have served for the first time in this honorable house. On entering the halls of the parliament, it was not in this esteemed chamber but it certainly was a chamber that was esteemed by the very fact that the parliament was being held there. As a young member, I looked very eagerly to understanding the culture of the parliament. And of course, in doing so, one looks at not just the members that experience on one side, but you also look on the other side at members who are experienced because as a young member, it is important to learn the culture and understand what is expected, what is not expected, what is parliamentary, what is not parliamentary. And it is something that we have to take very seriously, a responsibility, because we are an example to the young people of this nation. And so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when a member chooses to behave in ways that rarely brings into question the parliamentary and behavior and how honorable this house is, it gives one pause. Now I note that the speaker made a ruling and uh, that was not acceptable to the person that may have raised the motion at the time. And I understand that when you are in a position of authority and you make a decision, then not everyone can be pleased with it. However, we are members of an honorable house, and therefore, when rulings are taken in this parliament, it is honorable for us, as exemplars to this country, to abide by those rulings and to behave in ways that do not bring the house into odium and disrepute. The Honorable Speaker, I am certain, understood the gravitas of what was done outside of this honorable house when a member, and that member being a member for Orpuch East, took umbrage with the decision that was made in this house. And not only did the member take umbrage, he chose to go outside of this house and make statements that clearly were not meant to hold the honor of this house out to the population. And in so doing, that was an undermining of the very foundation of this house. And therefore, the speaker, in her wisdom, must have defended this house. And it was important that she did so, because we stand here and represent the country. And when we do that, we must understand 
that is an awesome responsibility. And what we say in and out of this house matters to those who are listening, to the young people that we are grooming to take our place when the time comes. And therefore, when a member steps out of this house and brings and says things that can be really disreputable to the honorable proceedings of this house, it is incumbent that someone steps up, takes notice, and calls it for what it is. And that is exactly what the speaker did on uh, May 8th. Because it was important for her to note the breach and to make an example of the member that did so, so that no one else would dare to disrespect this house in the way that it was disrespected. And that is what we have to understand. Because if we undermine our very principles by which we are governed, then how is it that we expect our country to run in the way that it must? And if we as parliamentarians and lawmakers are the ones committing the act, then it is even worse. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in doing what was done in this House, what the Speaker did was actually the opposite of what this motion imputes. What, it, what the Speaker did was to ensure that the honor of the House is maintained. And that was very important. And as a young parliamentarian, looking on at the culture of the Parliament, looking on at what is parliamentary, what is unparliamentary, I applaud the Speaker for the move that she made to maintain the honor of the House. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, when I look at this motion and see that the Speaker is accused of bringing the high and noble office of the Speaker into disrepute, and I contrast that with the mover of the motion, and what I have seen and been appalled at as a young member of parliament in this house, what passed for parliamentary behavior on at least two significant occasions, this very member who is now accusing the speaker of bringing the house into, disrep into disrepute, this very member of for Orpuch each, from Orpuch East, sorry, is one member that can be looked at at the entire population as having done exactly what he is accusing the speaker of doing. And I do not understand. For motives to a member of the House, there is no substantive motion before this House dealing with anybody else except the speaker. Can your point quickly, member? Yes, I'm tying in my point. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker by saying that exactly what the speaker is being accused of is exactly what I have seen pass before me and is recorded on the Hansard by the mover of this motion. Again, the, the member continues to impute improper motives. There is no substantive motion against the member for our chief here. And so, one must be, as a young parliamentarian, Wondering, therefore, what exactly constitutes parliamentary, what exactly constitutes bringing, keeping the order of this house, and therefore looking at who is speaking about disrepute, bringing the house into disrepute, one must consider, therefore, the actions of both the speaker as well as the person who moves the motion, because they are both important in comparing and contrasting what is before us in this motion. And if we speak then about censuring the speaker and considering that the speaker in her statement that is now being accused of being um, a breach of the established rules of conduct and conventions, if we consider that what was put before us on that day was put before us in an attempt to ensure to maintain the dignity of this house, then it is clear that if there is someone that is bringing the house into disrepute, it is certainly not the speaker of the house. As a matter of fact, the very opposite is what is being done by the speaker. And uh, in that sense, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to completely reject this motion, and I want to completely reject it from the point of view of a young parliamentarian who is looking on at more experienced members and expects that they will all, like the speaker, 
in doing what she did on that day, uphold the reputation of this house, always act with dignity and honor because we are expected to do so. We are elected to do so. And therefore, when we accuse the speaker of doing, bringing the house into, disre into disrepute, we must be careful that it is not us ourselves who are doing this very thing that we are accusing the speaker of. Mr. Deputy Speaker, today I am disappointed because what I saw in all of the speakers from the opposite side coming forward really are grouses that seem to be long held and in local parlance, you mind this grouse. And this day seems to be a day where everyone on the opposite side wants to come out and say what problem they had and they didn't get to speak and who get to speak and it all sounds so puerile. And it all makes me feel very sad as a young parliamentarian because this is not what is expected. When we have difficulties with decisions, and that has happened on both sides, and I've seen it on both sides, the modus operandus must not be to bring a motion and then accuse the speaker of everything that they wanted to say before they brought this motion. It seems very childish. It seems very puerile, and it's a disappointment and a complete waste of parliamentary time. And I do hope, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that as we recover from this, the population will take it out of their minds because it really serves not to bring us into any honorable position with the population, but it serves really to show the population that whereas we should be spending our time discussing more important things, we are spending our time discussing grouses uh, because we feel as though we were mistreated. And that is a sad thing. And I know that our young population, many have expressed to me, especially about this motion, that they are not pleased to see us spend our time like this. I have heard nothing that has substantiated any reasonable claim to uphold this motion, and therefore I completely renounce it and I uphold the actions of the speaker as being honorable and one that always defends the dignity of this house. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank you. I, rec I recognize the member for St. Augustine. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I always enjoy hearing my learned friend from San Fernando, um, St. Anne's East, but certainly she has fallen into the trap of the ethos of the PNM, which is cold, C-O-L-D. First, they conflate the issues, then they obfuscate the issues, they then label their target and then demonize. This debate, although brought in the name of the member for Oropoch East, really has little to do with the personality of Oropoch East. It has everything I agree with the dignity and fairness of this house. This ought to be the home of democracy, where we appreciate the majority, but certainly respect the rights of the minority. And this is really where the tire hits the road. To have heard my friends on the other side say that this motion is doomed to failure. That is nothing new. Inbuilt in this structure is the majority of the government. And therefore, if there be a vote on any issue, the majority is 21. They have that number. But I am of the view that a battle is not worth fighting only because and only when you think you can win. A battle is fought sometimes for the dignity and for the purpose for which the message must go. And I equally, Mr. Deputy Speaker, take, take absolutely no pleasure. In fact, I had not even intended to speak in this parliament on this matter. But I grew up learning that advantage should never be sustained. And I have sensed that in this election period, which began in 2010, because there was an unrelenting propaganda that anything other than the PNM was not worthy, and that only what they did was good, sanctimonious, holy, 
and wholly hypocritical. And that is why I've decided to speak on this matter. Let us refocus ourselves. At issue here on this motion is this point. First of all, whether the speaker ought to have recused herself when the matter of paria became known to her that a motion for, of definite matter of pub, urgent public importance was being brought and whether the speaker should give permission. And you know, we keep hearing about the discretion of the speaker and the speaker's wide discretion. You know what is true here? The speaker doesn't have wide discretion on these matters. The speaker has absolute discretion. And it refers and references that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, I'm not saying that lightly or to cast any aspersion on the good lady. This is not what I'm about here. But I heard the sometimes eloquent member for Dago Martin West speak about the member and in relation to that motion had not authenticated documentary evidence or whatever it was that was required for the speaker to apply her discretion. That is obfuscation. Because the essence is the moment that document came into the hand or into the knowledge of the speaker, where Paria, and correct me if I'm wrong, the chairman of which is the spouse of the speaker. That is the moment of finality. Because you cannot look beyond. And in the law, we have something called pecuniary interest. And if it is, that the chairman of Paria, a commercial entity, is dealing with sale of fuel or purchase of fuel, and I'm sure that he must have some pecuniary benefit in it, a salary, a stipend, whatever. And if one cohabitates as a spouse or spouses would in this country, then there is a real issue of pecuniary interest. And therefore, the stage is well set at a much higher level for the issue of apparent bias. And the Honourable Speaker, and we all human, with all due respect, erred horribly in pursuing even to look at the document beyond the Imperium. That is the first hurdle that my learned friends have not attempted to even broach, because they cannot cross it with all due respect. But there is more. The issue at hand was whether this should have qualified as a matter of definite matter of urgent public importance. When was the date for this? 27th of April, 2020. Nothing is in a vacuum here. We live in a very small country with the ravages of COVID that had so many afraid, scared, masked or unmasked. We were told that we had to protect this nation from the demonic plague called COVID-19 that wreaked havoc in other places with thousands and now hundreds of thousands of deaths throughout the length and breadth. And indeed, it was visited upon us that Minister of Health, I believe, with eight deaths we had? Eight. So let us understand how this matter of the paria sale or the supposed alleged paria sale to Venezuela arose and why it became a matter of urgency, a matter of importance, and certainly a matter of public interest, rabid public interest. Timelines are important. I'm a lawyer, and therefore I deal with the facts and the evidence. What was known to the population, and certainly I imagine the very erudite member for Urupuch East, this country learned not when it happened, but subsequent to the 26th of March, 2020. To the horror of many who have friends in Venezuela, and certainly to all those who want a neighbor whose leadership is beyond reproach, that the Department of Justice in the United States issued indictments against 14 very high-ranking, including the President 
of Venezuela, indictments for narco trafficking. This is rigid. This is potent. This is explosive. Understand, Deputy Speaker, that we are dealing with the 26th of March. We learnt sometime after that notwithstanding the closure of our airspace at midnight on the 20, Minister of National Security, the 21st or 22nd of March, the closure of our airspace. Thank you so much. But it was ripped open to deliver onto us a private jet with the personalities of the Vice President of Venezuela, Delzi and a group. And it was painful for me to have heard my Prime Minister and my friend, the Minister of National Security, parade their points of view as to what this opening of the border was for. We learned very feebly that it was about discussing what? COVID. I, with all due respect, found that a bit difficult, not just to bite into, but certainly to digest. It gets far worse. Stumbling along, we were given different versions as to who, <laughs> who we opened our borders to accommodate. A group of men so, accompanying... Uh, member, excuse me, remember sorry. the debate is not totally on what you're saying. So tie in the point and bring it back to the yes. recitals, please. I appreciate that one does not yet or could not yet see the relevance, but let me show you how relevant this is. Because we got versions of who accompanied the Vice President of Venezuela. It turns out, however, that in that group was a very high-ranking member of the government involved with energy, who became the head of the leading oil company in Venezuela. This, remember what happened? 26, we have indictment. I would imagine the severity of, of um, examination of all the names of all those who are coming to ensure that these are not persons under indictment coming into Trinidad and Tobago on this 26th, on this 20, sorry, on the 27th. Guess what? On the 28th, an advance was made to Paria to purchase fuel. Look at the timeline. And I say in the courts of Trinidad and Tobago, there's something we call circumstantial evidence. And in the minds of many, not averse to the government, but to the minds of those who care about this country, who are patriotic, became very worried, I am included in that number, as to the real purpose. And there was about grave concerns that oil had been sold to Venezuela. And as a result of which, a country that was already under sanction and the, pri the president and senior members now under indictment for narco trafficking and therefore the source of funds for that. And I know my friend from San Fernando West, I was so grateful he was not part of that meeting with Delzi and others. So grateful, because he has gone internationally with FASCA and so to deal with the issue of narco trafficking and money laundering. And questions were raised in the public domain as to whether money from narco trafficking might be used to pay for the oil from Trinidad and Tobago. These are the serious things that many were concerned about. But it became worse. Because already in the public domain and in the international media, there was word of sanctions. And I asked my friends, because you hear it said repeatedly, and though I'm not a member of the United National Congress, I'm a member of the Society of Trinidad and Tobago. And I myself want answers, because it was, I was appalled when I was told that the UNC called for sanctions. But I said, who, who? and I believed it for a moment, and I said, where was that? I have not seen a bit of paper. I have not heard a voice from the United National Congress calling for sanctions. What I heard was members on the other side reinterpreting and obfuscating, conflating, labeling and demonizing again and put and it has become almost a, a, a given truth that the united national congress called for sanctions 
If it is true, I want no part of you. But I have not found one stitch of evidence to say that you called for sanctions. Indeed, the acting prime minister on many occasions, Diego Martin West, attempted to speak to this matter and referenced the letter for the member for um, Orokuch East, where he says it could lead to sanctions, a letter, whether advisably or not, to the ambassador of the United States. You believe, you believe, Mr. Speaker, that the United States did not know more than any one of us here in Trinidad and Tobago knew already? So let us get real. You think a letter to the ambassador gave him any further information? What I suspect, because I'm not one to always look at the worst interpretation of a person's action, I suspect what might have been, and maybe he should say so publicly, is that the member for Oropoch East wanted the Americans to know, listen, if there was any kind of na nastiness going on with trading, with a sanctioned narco trafficking government, the opposition had no part of it. And that with an impending election, if there are to be sanctions, hold your hand, because whoever may have acted upon it would not have acted with the authority, consent of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is the way I saw it. But coming back to this issue, that the speaker has absolute discretion whether to allow that debate to go forward. It is wrong for anybody to have absolute power. And the way forward, if I may suggest humbly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you are a good and noble man. We've been friends for years in the past, and I look forward to friendship into the future. I look forward to a country where we could find and fix things. I do not believe that we could endure, as we have in the past, when we were in government. They accused the Speaker to be biased for us and against the PNM. And now, whether there is evidence or not, there will always be the allegation. But on this issue, the Speaker had no right to decide whether she should allow the debate or not. Could I suggest for the record, in terms of constitutional reform, Attorney General, that to respect the democracy, that is the right of the minority, you could have an evil-minded and very biased Speaker who will shut down every attempt to debate an issue that is not favorable to the leading government, who, with, with all due respect, appoints the Speaker because they have the majority, so that it should be in our future in this parliament that where every member of the opposition says, I want this matter debated, then that must override the discretion of any speaker. Pause for a moment and think about that. If every member of the opposition says, I want a matter debated, then no speaker should say, I will not allow you to speak on this matter. That is the way that we strengthen democracy. Because nothing is wrong with debate. Debate is healthy, it is important. We learn from it, we strengthen ourselves. There is great disrespect for our institutions. And this institution, my learned friends, today at, at tea, some said, was possibly one of the worst experiences we've had. We attacked, went back and forth. But I want to say that we can be opponents, but we do not have to be enemies. If you love this country, then let us fix it. But it went even first, further than that. In this very parliament, I'm hearing names being called of members on my side of being traitors. It was in the public domain where the leader of the opposition was accused of being a traitor. Do you know how corrosive, how deadly dangerous, especially in an environment where elections are close, to spark in the mind of lesser beings the belief that that is true and potentially lead away from the very peaceful elections we've had in the past and for the easy and, and dulcetic transfer of power after an election is announced, the winner being, and we see what is happening in Guyana. Tra I know my friend, my MP from, from St. Joseph, will never ascribe, ascribe to that, to damage the democracy by throwing out terms. Traitor, a traitor in the past, in fact, under our law, the penalty and remember, is death. Tie it in, tie it in, please. Oh, I tie it with the news that is required to show the importance of what I am saying and the relevance of this. Because if we continue to believe that one side has the ability 
to point fingers, to accuse the other of corruption unrelentingly, of now being a traitor internationally, then the democracy itself is under attack. And this here is the bastion of the democracy, and we must protect it. Mr. Speaker, I want to say, whether you like the member for, for Oropuch East or not, thank you for bringing this matter. I was not attracted to begin with, but as I heard the debate proceed, I realized it was important because there is no greater sin than to allow power to accrue without challenge. A democracy requires that we question everything and hold up to the light whether you have overreached and if you do not do these things because you're afraid. Thank you so much. You're afraid for the odium that may be poured upon you and certainly was poured upon the member for Oropuchis and he took it like a man. Unafraid. He must have known the consequence and the bullets that were put into his direction. But he did it. And therefore, you know that statement that fungus grows in the dark. And the best form of disinfectant is light. Whether you agree or you do not agree with either position in support of the motion or not, light has been put on an issue that needs fixing in this country. Mr. Speaker, in the last minute that I have, let me just say I myself, the learned Prime Minister, said many have to be heard because they do not know what their future is. I am one. I will always be heard long before I was in government, long before I was in politics, and I assure you, whether I'm here or not, I will be heard because I love this country, like many of my colleagues on both sides, and we want the best for our nation. And therefore, if this might be my last speech here, I cannot say. But what I tell you comes truly from what I believe without any animosity, anger, or any ill will to anyone. What I speak for is our continuous improvement. So I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank all my colleagues, and I hope that we understand that the nation looks upon us for the direction that we will go in, good or bad. Thank you very much. I recognize the member for a rebound. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member for St. Augustine, when he began his contribution, he stated quite emphatically that it was not his intention to address this house this afternoon. I think it would have done him so much better if he had kept his seat, because what he said over the last 20 minutes amounted to almost nothing. Usually, usually, the member for St. Augustine is quite eloquent, but today it Please. was just rambling and rambling and rambling without any substance. One second. Members, please, please, I would like to hear the discourse of the member. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have examined this motion carefully, and I have found absolutely nothing in this motion that would cause any one of us on this side any great concern because the motion really lacks substance. Mr. Speaker, the move of the motion, in my mind, really underlines the fact that exists that he has an inability and a problem in thinking logically. To the motion at hand, and it's ad hominem in its. It, it. Please, please. Again, remember, I'll give you the opportunity to tie in your point. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is strange that my good friend from Naparima, with whom I shared 
a hostel for two years could stand and talk such things that, are, that, that do not make sense. Anyway, let me get back to the main uh, motion that we are looking at today. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this parliament operates in accordance with rules. Rules that guide us along while we debate motions that come before us. The speaker, as has been said on many occasions, has the responsibility to ensure that the debate or debates are carried out, are conducted in an orderly fashion. When a member runs afoul of the speaker, that speaker has every right to chastise that member. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am not here this afternoon to defend the speaker, I am sure. The speaker, the honorable speaker, is capable, fully capable of defending herself. But what I wish to do is to draw to the attention of this House the many inconsistencies that are connected with this motion. I'm amazed in reading the recitals that a simple act of the speaker, an act that is in accordance with her duties and responsibilities, would be seen by a member to bring this house into disrepute. I just can't understand it. We have to be careful, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when we are making pronouncements, when we are debating motions, to ensure that when we speak, we speak on behalf of the persons that we represent. But not only do we speak on behalf of the persons we represent, but we also speak to the entire country. And in this instance, we speak to the entire country of Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, whatever we say must be well put forward. It must contain substance. It must lack truth and thought, and proper thought. Because out there, we might have a number of persons one, listening. Deputy Speaker, can the minister get to the motion, please? <laughs> Overruled. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I know the strategy that has been employed by the opposition this evening is to seek to interrupt the speakers, but that strategy will not work. Mr. Point of it will not work. It has failed. And it will continue 48, to fail. 48 1, 48 1, Deputy Speaker. 48 1. And continue 48 2 also. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am confused by the arguments that have been put forward by the member of Urpuch East this afternoon in his presentation. The arguments lacked coherence, the arguments lacked substance, and there was an absence of the logical sequence of thought. I could not understand for the life of me what was the common thread behind his arguments. And 53.2 and 53.3. <laughs> Overruled. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I will not be perturbed by these interruptions. As I said before, I know this is a strategy that has been employed. The move of the motion, member for Overpuch, Overpuch East, in his presentation said that he would take on anyone at any time. I want to assure the member for Overpuch East that I am willing and ready to take him on. Because he's accustomed to throwing, to throwing tantrums. And this afternoon was a classic example of, it, of tantrum throwing. He behaves like a little child who has lost his toy. And therefore, he can't find it. Deputy Speaker 48.4, come on. Please yeah, call the Minister yeah. of Education to be talking like this. Um, 
Members, members, hold on, hold on. Miss Fripp, I just want clarity on, on, on your standing order. What, 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 what? He's calling my member childish. Come on. I think in these circumstances, that should be a compliment. Okay. Um, members. Again, um, honorable member, withdraw and rephrase. Withdraw and rephrase. I withdraw. I withdraw. But the arguments that he presented this afternoon are childlike. I won't say childish, are childlike. Because they lack, as I said, coherence. There's an absence of any proper thinking behind his arguments. And it really appeared to me that here was a gentleman with a bruised ego. A gentleman talking where his ego was severely bruised. In addition to this, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this motion really is an election gimmick by the opposition. It is intended for all purposes to salvage a lot of the lost ground that this opposition has suffered. And I'm sure that under any whereas, yeah. I am sure the member for Oaputch East will have an opportunity member, member to please, respond. Please. Thank you very much. Overruled. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This afternoon, in this house, we were treated with some theatrics. Theatrics by several members of the opposition in their failed attempt to bring some semblance of meaning to this motion. This motion, I'm sure, will fail definitely. This motion does not have the support of this government, and this motion is doomed to failure. I thank you very much. Thank you. But you recognize me first. Hold on, let me, let me. No, 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 I, I stood up. The man recognized me. Hello, member, please. I have ruled. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And um, it is, of course, a pleasure to be back to the podium the second time for the day to wind up the debate on this matter. I want to begin by thanking all my colleagues on my side of the house, on this side of the house, for the, for the very deep, considerate, and well thought of presentations from the member for Point Pierre, the member for Naparima, the member for St. Augustine, who else? Karani East, I was leaving Karani East, but any but the other colleagues, I think, that would have been it for the evening. The member for Karen East, who walked out of his own recuperation after surgery on his knee to come and deliver a very powerful presentation this evening. I want to thank him sincerely and all colleagues on this side of the house for their contribution and their support to this very important motion. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is a motion that deals with the Speaker of the House of Representatives and not the government policy. I want to make it very clear. This is a matter that is a, called a substantive motion. It deals with the, the conduct of the chair. It is not a motion that is critical of government policy. And there's a reason why I'm putting that on the record very early o'clock. No part of this motion 
is critical of government policy. It raises questions in a substantive motion on the conduct of a speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the first time in life, 19 years I've been here, and I've been described as throwing a tantrum. Before today, I probably couldn't spell the word. But I, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I throw no tantrums, I throw no teacups, I throw no water. I'm not a person like that. I've listened to all my colleagues and, and members opposite spoke with a lot of love. Um, the Prime Minister, no lesser person than the Prime Minister, responded to my earlier intervention. And the Prime Minister spent a considerable amount of time dealing with a gentleman by the name of something, I cannot pronounce the name and I've never heard it before. But I suspect he was some traitor of some kind. And I don't know the name, but the Prime Minister was um, engaging him. The member for St. Augustine, may I also thank him as well for his very, very deep and considerate thoughts on this matter. And he asked the defining question. No one opposite could have crossed the first obstacle to defend the decision of the speaker not to refer this matter to the deputy speaker. This matter had absolutely nothing to do with whether my motion on the 27th of April qualified or not. And colleagues opposite were spending a lot of time talking about the motion of the 27th. It didn't matter. Even if it did not qualify, that was not the issue. The issue, the issue was that the speaker ought not to have entertained it. Because it touched and concern a company, a commercial entity, headed by her spouse. That is all the issue was. It was not whether that motion had merit. The Prime Minister stood up here, and I have his note, and said categorically that Paria never sell no fuel to Venezuela. The member, the Minister of National Security, continued. He was like mini-me to the member for Dago Martin West. He continued that, that the opposition concocted and fabricated and created this whole thing. But you know, the motion of the 27th, the Speaker could not have undertaken an investigation by the 27th. I put it to you, neither the government. So how you knew and the, on the 27th it was not true and, and, and not authenticated and so on? But you see, the Prime Minister let the story out of his mouth when he said categorically that Paria was not involved in selling fuel to Venezuela. He said that categorically. To this day, it is a matter of public record that the government has accepted that there was a clause in a contract against the resale of fuel to Venezuela. And that clause could have been violated. We have called on the Prime Minister to ask the Attorney General to ask the Attorney General to investigate that. The Prime Minister said, no, we are not investigating that full stop. Matter of public record. And the Prime Minister defended Paria. But I will go one step further. You see, this entire debate today, suddenly it became about me. I mean, I think no speaker opposite failed to say something about the member for Arupuji. You would think I was selling fuel to Venezuela. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister started, started, and I want to deal with one thing immediately, and let me deal with it and get it out of the way. Because I knew, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I know them. If you give me mud and water, I could make them. I knew what they were coming with today. So when I talk, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when I talk, I knew they were coming after to say this man can't speak about nothing about conflict of interest because they throw him out of a GSC because the commissioner of police said this man connected to um, criminals. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I am quoting what the member for Diego Martin West and the member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, spoke about. They went on record today again. And I'm not going to throw no tantrum there neither. They put on record that again that the member for Oropuchis cannot talk. How you could talk, the, the House had to throw you out of a GSC. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I just have two letters to respond to that because it was raised in this debate by no lesser person than the Prime Minister and Minister of National Security. Mr. Speaker, in the aftermath of, of being pelt out of a GSC, by this house, by a majority of the PNM, my lawyer Israel Khan wrote to Commissioner Gary Griffith, March 2nd, 2020, and I'm responding here 
to the direct attack I face today from National Security Minister and Prime Minister. The letter dated March 2nd said, Restatement of Mr. Stuart Young in the Press 2020. I am counsel for Dr. Rudolf Munilal. He's an attorney as well as serving opposition member. In January and February 2020, there have been several newspaper articles quoting statements made by Mr. Stuart Young. He has made allegations and some specific allegations. In particular, the minister has stated that he has received information linking members of the opposition to criminal elements of which Dr. Munilal is presently a member. The minister is reported to have said, I have been provided with information by arms of national security. I have read them suggesting, uh, not only was I told, but National Security Council was told by the Toronto Tobago Police Service that in their opinion, instruction was given. Mr. Speaker, I am responding to a charge against me in this debate. Battles and legal challenges in this house, and is using the house to do that. Mr. Deputy Speaker, nothing is before the court at this One time. Second. One second. One second, member. Uh, honorable member, simple question. Is this matter before the court? No, this matter is not before the court, sir. Nothing related to this is before any court. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you can, and I go by, I stand by that. He's using this, is a this sitting to advance his case, madam. Mr. I Deputy came Speaker. under an accusation. Listen, one second. <laughs> what, <laughs> what is this? But you can make allegations against me, but I can't. Again, overrule. Thank you very much. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the letter from Mr. Khan goes on. The minister's general statements have been followed by specific statements alleging that Dr. Munilal is involved in such a link to criminal elements. And it continues, I don't want to quote the entire letter, but the long and short is the letter continues to say that this is part of a political campaign where the Minister of National Security continue to repeat these outlandish, preposterous, and absurd allegations and so on, which, which was done today. So I stopped that letter. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on March 13, 2020, I received a letter from the Toronto Tobago Police Service, Office of the Commissioner of Police. Well, I did not receive the letter, sorry, let me correct that. Mr. Israel B. Raja Khan, Senior Counsel, in reply to Mr. Khan's letter, Dear Mr. Raja Khan, Police Investigations into Honorable Rudal Munilal. Reference is made to a letter dated March 2nd, 2020. Um, Honourable Member, sure. again, you're going to quote verbatim from, from the particular letter? It's, it's a four-line letter, sir. Yeah. Please be informed that the head of, of the Special Investigative Unit has indicated that based on the information that they have at this time, your client, the Honourable Dr. Rudal Munilal MP, is not a suspect of any ongoing police investigation in relation to any gang-related offences in violation of the existing criminal law. Signed by Mr. C the acting commissioner at the time, Irwin Hackshaw, Commissioner of Police. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the police... Mr. Deputy Speaker, there's... What's standing order? Uh, point of order. P point of order. The letter says at this time, and the investigations are continuing. <laughs> See, they spent a lot of time on that, failing to say that the report that came to Parliament was an incomplete report where the Commissioner of Police was not allowed to finish a sentence. It was the first time in life that a report was, came to a Parliament that was incomplete, where somebody is given evidence, and they couldn't even finish giving the evidence. A report came, Prime Minister and Government, hold on to that. But when the Commissioner of Police says, there is no, at this time, there is absolutely nothing to do with Dr. Munilal, member for Arapuchis. They can't take it. But I'll move on because that's not my main point here. Point of order. My next point, Mr. Point Deputy Speaker. Point of order, Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker. The member quoted a letter. The letter says, at this time, okay. and the investigations into gang-related activities okay. are continuing. Okay, okay. Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me proceed because the member for Lavantil West cannot tell this house he knows what investigation is taking place. Well, you... Uh, members, 
letter. You know. Listen. How do you know? Members. How you know? Hello. Members. Okay. On both sides. Carney East, Love Until West. Please. I'm not allowing those, those um, outbursts. I'm on my legs, members, and you all are walking. Carney East, I'm on my legs. No more outbursts like those, please. Okay, I'll just see. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy. Mr. Deputy, well, let me proceed. Members of the government opposite on several occasions described the opposition's raising of the matter of the uh, fuel sale from Paria. They responded to that today in this debate by stating that that was a fallacy, it was a fantasy, we created it, we manufactured it, etc., etc. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister began by that. Now, the Prime Minister had no duty today to, in, in, to say anything else or to, anyway, leave that. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I have in my hands certain documents here, which I would just want to, to make reference to one or two of the documents. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, it will surprise members of the national community that we have the evidence, it is in my hand now, that Paria Trading imported fuel coming out of a place in Italy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Coming out of Italy... Honorable Member, yeah. we went over that already for the day. This is, you would be, hold on, you would make it now the eighth person, right, that would be speaking on that particular aspect. Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, unless I missed it, I try not to stay away from the debate today. But anyone quoted the final invoice from Traffic Gura, final invoice dated 6 April 2020. No, but, but Member, it's in relation to the particular aspect that we are dealing with, the purchase of the fuel. That's, yes. that's the point I'm trying to make. So yes. you would, this would be the ninth time today it, this would be coming up based on standing order 48.1, that it would be. Mr. Mr. Okay, sure, fine. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, may I add that no one would give the details that I'm about to give? Because I did not know, I could not anticipate in my opening that members would have defended paria trading that way. So I did not give the details. I'm here now with the details. Can I proceed? proceed? Sure, thank you very much. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there was a load in Augusta, Italy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of fuel sent to Paria. It was, it was sent by Traffi Gura, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and paid for by that company to the tune, Mr. Deputy Speaker, of 7.9 million United States dollars. This was on 6 April 2020. Mr. Deputy Speaker, having bought this fuel, Paria Trading paid, or they should have paid, 7.9 million United States dollars. Mr. Speaker, it is more than coincidental that having bought fuel on the 6th of April, later on the 14th, fuel is then sold to a company Related to Traffi Gura. It is a father and son company. Fuel is then sold to that company that is initially headed to St. Eustatius in the Caribbean, then goes to Aruba. Then the Aruba government says they did not have the fuel on, the, on land. They did not take it on land. And the fuel then moves to Venezuela. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are banking transactions between RCB. Republic Bank Limited, FCB, Paria Fuel Trading Company Limited, and I will not quote that in detail either, and a, and a Dutch um, and Dutch bank, Hon Mr. Honorable Deputy Member, Speaker. Honorable Member, as I mentioned to you earlier, this has been dealt with extensively in the debate so far. Kindly pr oh, um, proceed. Thank Honor. you very much. Mr. Deputy Speaker, those, those facts and details will come out at another time. The... The member for Diego Martin Northeast spoke of the concept of economic sanctions and sought in a classic way to defend the government's position. The government is arguing or at all material times that the opposition recommends sanctions and promotes sanctions. When the member for Diego Martin Northeast got caught because he could not find in that letter any line that recommended or promoted um, sanctions, he then changed his tune. 
He said it was the concept of economic sanctions that was introduced. As if the United States Department of the Treasury don't know anything about the concept of economic sanctions. And the member for St. Augustine corrected him by indicating that our role and function was to indicate to the American authorities and the world, whether it's the European Union or, or not, we do not support the government with that madcap plan they have. We did not support the government with any alleged sale of fuel to Venezuela. That is all, Mr. Speaker, that is all. And the parrier issue, the door is not closed. Because you see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have been told and we, we, we read in the international press that investigations into the violation of economic sanctions continue. They continue. So that matter is certainly not closed. Remember, the member for St. Anne's East told us... Sure. Well, I'll forget St. Anne's East. Um, well, the member for Arima, all I could say to him is goodbye. I'll miss you. Um, yes. A penny for his thoughts, I thought. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, today, in the two minutes left, let me say that when I came to the parliament, I knew the slings and arrows would come. I knew that. I knew it would come from everyone. I was prepared for that. That is not, to me, a big problem. But I wanted the government to answer the central question that on that day of April 27th, when this matter came to the desk of the substantive speaker, did she have a duty or not to recuse herself? That was the question. And that will always be the question. The government argued today, and I think the prime minister said, he said that was never an issue because we never sell fuel to Venezuela. The speaker in her note, I don't want to quote, I don't have time to quote, but in her announcement, that famous announcement, and this is not somebody who is responding to announcement because you feel, um, you know, hurt or something. I mean, you're not, we're not hurt. We are responding to it on democratic principles, the rule of law, and values. The, the member did not tell us that on the 27th of April, no one, including the Prime Minister, could have said with certainty what happened with that transaction. So the Speaker could not have known anything. She could not have known. So in turning down the motion, she did not know. But again, I want to make the point, the point is not whether the motion was turned down or not. The point is that the person in the chair did not recuse herself and committed a breach and brought the, the House into disrepute and brought the noble office of Speaker into disrepute. And I repeat, this is about the Speaker. It is not, it is not condemning government policy. I thank you very much, Mr. Deputy. Honourable members, the question is, be it resolved that the House censures the Speaker for failure to act properly and impartially in the exercise of her office. All in favour, say aye. aye. Those against? No. Mr. Al Singh? No. Dr. Ali? No. Mr. Alwari? No. Mr. Imbert? No. Mr. Young? No. Mr. Hine? No. Mr. Mitchell? No. Mr. Leon? No. Ms. Kojo? No. Mr. Garcia? No. Dr. Katsi Dolly? No. Mr. Dillon? No. Mrs. Webster Roy? No. Dr. Francis? No. Ms. Olivier? No. Mr. Antoine? No. Mr. Cuffey? No. Mr. Lee? Yes. 
Mr. Charles? Yes. Dr. Rambachan? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Dr. Tiwari? Yes. Dr. Munira? Yes. Dr. Gopi Singh? Yes. Dr. Khan? Yes. Mr. Indar Singh? Yes. Mr. Ramada? Yes. Dr. Bodo? Yes. Ms. Ramdial? Yes. Mr. Pari? Yes. Mrs. Gaideen Gopi Singh? Yes. Honorable members, by division, 14 members voting for, 17 members voting against, no abstention, the motion is not carried. question is that a bill entitled an act to amend the Kabir Association of Trinidad Incorporation Ordinance 1932 be now read a second time. All in favor say aye. Any against? All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. A bill entitled an act to amend the Kabir Association of Trinidad Incorporation Ordinance 1932. Honorable members, the question is that the Kabir Association of Trinidad Incorporation Amendment Bill 2019 be committed to a committee of the whole. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any against? The ayes have it. This House will now go into a committee of the whole to consider the bill clause by clause. The question is that clauses 1 and 2 stand part of the bill. The question is that clauses 1 and 2 now stand part of the bill. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clauses 1 and 2 now stand part of the bill. Honorable members, the question is that the bill be now reported to the House. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. This committee meeting is now adjourned. The House shall be seated.
Honorable members, the bill having been considered in committee of the whole and approved without amendment, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Kabir Association of Trinidad Incorporated Ordinance 1932 be forthwith read a third time and passed. All in favor say aye. aye. Any again? The ayes have it. A bill entitled An Act to Amend the Kabir Association of Trinidad Incorporation Ordinance 1932. Leader of the House. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that this House do now adjourn to Wednesday, 1st July 2020 at 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon on that day. It is the government's intention to debate the miscellaneous amendment number two act. Thank you very much. Whip. Are we embarking on any of the... Honorable members, the question is that this house do now adjourn to Wednesday, the first day of July, 2020, at 1.30 p.m. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any again? I think the ayes have it. This house now stands adjourned to Wednesday, the first day of July, 2020, at 1.30 p.m. <laughs>